I'm Dr. Gregory Gatiss. Uh, I'm a professor at Hawaii Pacific University. I'm here today to continue the series that Dr. King and I started uh, several weeks ago on the impending collapse of uh, industrial civilization. In that format, we looked at various ways in which our whole civilization was going to be threatened, and with the idea being, what can we do to stop it? What can we do to m make things better? And we went over a series of things in the first session. One is overpopulation, which started 1 billion people at 1800. By 1850, it was 2 billion. And then it just went up on an uh, escalating curve. So we're at 7 billion now, heading for 9 billion. And then probably before a huge starve off of billions of people, which would traumatize the whole world. So that was one consideration. Other, of course, is nuclear war. That would be a disaster if we and the Russians or Chinese were to get into this war uh, and launch nuclear weapons at each other, given the fact that we all have like 20,000 of these, there would be so much radiation, no one would survive on Earth. You could be in Australia, you're not going to survive, just like in the movie On the Beach in 1959. So we uh, explored that. More likely scenario, however, since the Chinese and the Russians are too smart to do something as stupid as that, is to take some of these end of times people who don't mind the world coming to an end, perhaps the Muslims, perhaps uh, Iran, perhaps North Korea, uh, launching something and starting something like that. And it may not be major, it may not be 20,000 ICBMs. If North Korea were to launch a nuclear missile and send it into the stratosphere right above the United States and explode that, and that would send an electrotic um, pulse down to the earth and fry our electric grid. And uh, that would be disastrous for us because we would lose 90% of our people in one year, according to Ted Koppel, who had wrote a book called Lights Out. Uh, maybe you've seen him on Nightline. Anyway, that was another major concern. We don't want to have that. And even if the North Koreans didn't do that, there was the concern about the electromagnetic pulse coming from the sun, which comes every 140 years. And we're due, because the last time this happened was about in 1860. And at that time, it did come down, but there was nothing electronic on the Earth to destroy, so nobody hardly noticed it. The only thing that got fried was the telegraph lines out there in the West. So people didn't realize how dangerous it was. But if we were to lose our grid, and it's not protected, it's one of the things we have to do, uh, that would be devastating for us as well. So we went over a number of these and things that we could do. Um, both Dr. King and I spent 40 years arguing about this, discussing this, trying to alert people to environmental disasters, global warming, and on and on and so forth. Um, but one thing we didn't talk about, because we had no expertise in, was what would happen if we had these infectious diseases, uh, which would go and wipe out populations and really traumatize people and lead to war and gang fighting and tribalization and on and on. <clears throat> Again, we had no expertise in this other than history. We had a few things in history, such as the, uh, well, the, the plague back in the 12th or 13th century wiped out a third of Europe, and that led to chaos, as, as we all know. And that all came about, actually, in a sense, from globalization. Once people started trading long distances, then the rats came with those ships, then the fleas came on the rats, then the plague came. People didn't know what the plague was caused by, and so it led to chaos and, and disorder. Uh, so what we want to do is bring this up to the 21st century, and we brought in an expert on this who did her dissertation on this, uh, Dr. Christine Hansen, who is my guest here today who uh, did her dissertation on this. And we want to hear from her, what are these infectious diseases that could in fact uh, destroy the earth? We had little touches of this when we saw the Ebola crisis there of West Africa, when so many doctors went in to save these people and the doctors themselves died, the nurses died just from being in contact with the blood and things like that. Uh, fortunately, that was contained. So okay, everybody goes back to sleep again, no problem. But is it really that easy? Is it that simple? Are there some waiting medical nuclear bombs waiting for us? For example, you've heard rumors about the um, resistant bugs. Penicillin was a great cure back in the 1830s for wiping out germs. But are there super germs now that are resistant and we have no uh, protection against? And what can we do? So for the first uh, part here, we're going to hear from Dr. Hansen about 
what she thinks are the major threats from infectious diseases to us and its globalization. Because globalization originally meant you just sent goods across borders, you sent money. But now we're sending people from civilizations who don't have, uh, let's say, protections against that. Just, just one thing I do know about that I can speak about, and that is, of course, when the Europeans came to America, the Native Americans, it was rather easy for them to take over the continent not because they killed that many, but because they had no protection against colds, flu, uh, John Smith might sneeze or something, and the tribe catches it and they all die. And so what the Europeans found is that when they go west, they find empty villages. Well, they found the empty villages because their diseases had killed these people before them. So the Native Americans know this tragedy firsthand. But is there something like that that can happen worldwide here? And for that, I'm going to turn to my... Uh, guest here today, Christine Hansen, uh, who also got her doctorate from the University of Hawaii, the same as I did, and who also teaches at Hawaii Pacific University, the same as I did. So, Dr. Hansen, nice to see you here. Thank you so much, Greg. And this is such an interesting topic. Um, and I think one thing that people don't realize is we're at a turning point, really, in emerging infectious disease. And the term emerging is often used because there is a paradigm shift. And so uh, between the period of World War II and, say, maybe uh, 10 to 20 years ago, we had the belief that infectious disease was really under control, that we were conquering infectious disease. But what we forgot to think about were really two things. The first was that uh, infectious diseases can reproduce much faster than people can. So because of that, they can develop resistance much more quickly than we re originally understood. So you mentioned the problem of uh, antibiotic resistance, and that is a problem that has emerged specifically because of this ability of the organisms to reproduce rapidly, the, the bacteria. Um, but the other factor is simply um, that these uh, organisms are interwoven with the entire ecosystem. So, you know, we have the idea that uh, a microbe comes when John Smith sneezes, but it also comes um, when John Smith is walking through the forest or uh, John Smith puts his hand down because his hand is covered in microbes. The surface of everything is covered in microbes and they're actually interwoven into the ecosystem. And we have done so much disturbance to those ecosystems on the earth that that, combined with our ability to travel uh, in jet planes and to move faster than the incubation periods of these organisms, has allowed uh, a number of novel viruses to come out of their ecosystem niches. And uh, you know we've seen the ravages already uh, of some of these. HIV would be an example. Uh, Ebola would be an example. The SARS virus would be an example. So we're looking at a scenario where uh, a variety of organisms that are living in their prescribed ecological niches have been disturbed by logging, by uh, overpopulation, which you mentioned. And these organisms are moving out of their accustomed niches and they're getting onto airplanes through people that have been infected or through animals because uh, the vast majority of the viruses that we're talking about are actually zoonotic organisms that start in animals mm -hmm. and then cross the species barrier. So. Uh, at the moment, there are a large number of influenza viruses that are circulating in birds that are of particular concern. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, that would be probably the group that's the most worrisome. Um, and then we have uh, another coronavirus, which is closely related to the SARS virus called MERS, which is circulating, uh, as you probably know, in the, uh, Arab, some of the Arab countries and actually has crossed over into humans from camels. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in the case of SARS, we came so close to not being able to uh, contain the outbreaks. Uh, and so the question is, at what point might we see an organism mm -hmm. that actually we won't be able to contain? And especially the problem there is with uh, respiratory illnesses because you can't stop breathing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's very difficult to avoid exposure to a respiratory virus. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, if the contact has to happen through the skin and, you know, bodily fluids or something, then it's much easier to avoid um, transmission. But um, the, the respiratory illnesses like uh, influenza, like uh, the coronaviruses, are a particular concern. And as we saw Ebola, we didn't really understand. So I remember back when I was doing my doctoral dissertation that I had noticed um, 
you know, a lot of research about the impact of Ebola and great ape populations. It's decimated the gorilla populations. And um, I thought that was kind of cause for some concern, you know, that uh, there are obviously some genetic relationships between human beings and gorillas. Um, and, um, but when I raised that, people sort of thought it was silly, mm -hmm. you know. And yet, we found that Ebola really could cause problems. And I think that's because um, we didn't fully understand Ebola. And we don't, uh, to be honest, understand most of these organisms all that well. So um, putting the genie back in the bottle, sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. But the higher the population, the more people are packed together. Um, when people are overcrowded, uh, then disease is more likely to be transmitted, as we saw in World War I. That I, I talked to you before the program about the, um, the World War I uh, influenza outbreak. That 1918 flu was caused in large part by uh, large groups of, of troop movements and people in overcrowded situations, people in stress situations. So um, as the world becomes more and more overpopulated and as we disturb more and more of these ecological niches and as we encroach onto environments where animals have been living undisturbed for long periods of time, we are actually putting ourselves at risk in ways that perhaps are much more dangerous than, say, you know, conventional war between human beings. And, um, and so that's one stream of the problem. The other stream of the problem is the rise of antibiotic resistance. And this is something that we haven't really seen since World War II, but which is very, very worrying. And in fact, um, the Lancet has um, been talking for a few years about the possibility that at some point people might not be able to do certain elective surgeries because the risk of infection will outweigh the potential benefits of doing those surgeries, which is but, but kind let, of- Let me just break in. When you say antibiotic, now we're moving from viruses to germs, is that it? Well, to bacteria. Bacteria. So when, when you talk about microorganisms, you're talking about viruses, bacteria, fungi, lots of different organisms. Mm -hmm. But primarily, um, most diseases that concern human beings would be uh, bacteria that aren't chronic diseases, mm -hmm. would be bacterial or viral. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and they're very, very different. Um, in how we handle them. A typical viral uh, problem would be handled, say, with a vaccine, if one were available, or sometimes with antiviral drugs, but they're actually much, they have been much harder to handle than a bacterial disease. So you mentioned the plague, um, and most people are familiar with the fact that it killed about a third of Europe, you know, at certain points in history. Um, well, why don't we uh, pause here for a moment, take a break, and then we'll, uh Take these diseases that you've exposed us to and, uh, <laughs> and, and maybe propose solutions, if any, that you might have. All right. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Aloha, Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as Senator from the Big Island on the Kona side and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. So we're back here with Dr. Christine Hansen from the University of Hawaii PhD and HBU professor who is enlightening us about the dangers of all these uh, infectious diseases that threaten civilization. Uh, she mentioned, of course, the, the flu of 1918. Actually, our troops, when they came back from World War I, they were accustomed to death there. They saw it there. But there are only 24 million deaths, I think, in World War I. But 
I think the flu took over 40 million deaths. So they were a little devastated to come back to the United States and find that their hometowns had been devastated by the flu, which we call the Spanish flu. We blame the Spanish, other people call the Americans. I'm not quite sure which troops brought it to, to but in any event, the intermingling of all those troops there and ki killing each other uh, led to this uh, flu, which uh, devastated the world there for a while. So. Um, You've introduced us to a number of things here, bacterial and viral and so forth, and fungi and so forth. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we can do, if anything, to minimize this. Uh, I'll just say one little uh, anecdote here. That's all I can provide here. Anecdotes, I have no expertise. Uh, this, uh, there was a man at the Alawai Canal who was gotten a fist fight, and he got hit by a guy, and I guess he ca caused a blood on his chin or something. He fell into the Alawai Canal. No one understood how dangerous the Alawai Canal was with all those pollutants. He came out, and then within a few hours, his, his leg was turning black and rotting, and he died within you know, six hours because there was this, uh, I guess, a bacterial infection in the water which killed him. And that still exists on the Big Isle. They had a, just recently someone who was just playing baseball and got cut on the knee. And there was maybe something in the soil that his knee then touched, and he picked up that. And I think he had to lose his legs, too, as a result of that. That was just recently. So this is nothing to fool around with. This is very serious stuff. So we have to turn back to our expert, Dr. Hansen, who did a dissertation on this, to um, tell us what could we do, perhaps, to mitigate these impending disasters to civilization. Okay, well, you mentioned uh, water, um, and of course, you wouldn't want to go swimming in brown water. Mm -hmm. I, I think most people know that, but um, you know, water can carry organisms such as flesh-eating bacteria, and um, so um, obviously some precautions after large rains and things like that are a good idea. But more broadly speaking, I think what our society really needs to do is the prospect of antibiotic resistance not being addressed is so potentially uh, devastating to our society. I mean, if you think even about tuberculosis, I think tuberculosis is an important disease to talk about because it is respiratory, so it's easily contracted. And it did kill 25% um, of the population um, at times. So it, historically, it's a very, very serious problem. And we, uh, the last person- That's airborne. Because Person to person. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, the the last person uh, who was um, uh, quarantined was actually quarantined for resistant strain of uh, quarantined from an airplane was was Andrew Speaker, and he was quarantined because of resistant strain of tuberculosis. So um, tuberculosis is something that. Um, is easily preventable with antibiotics. And the problem is with the rise of antibiotic resistance, we're looking at potentially the return of a disease that kills 25% of the population, you know. And that's not to mention the other emerging infectious diseases that we've talked about. So um, I think our society as a whole needs to invest very urgently in research into antibiotics. And unfortunately, our system of healthcare funding is such that um, the research is sometimes directed toward drugs that are, look like they'll be potentially profitable mm -hmm. rather than toward um, what might be the most beneficial for public health. So let me uh, break in here just for a second. Now, here's the problem we have a problem, we get a drug penicillin, whatever, mm -hmm. and then we admit it, ah, it solves a problem. But as you pointed out, the bacteria multiply rapidly, and the next generation soon develop a resistance to that, and that doesn't work. Or you give larger doses for a while, right. maybe that works, and larger doses, and finally larger doses mm -hmm. don't work, and you, uh-oh, oh, we need something new. Right. So we have to get something new. Now, aren't we always shoveling sand against the tide here? It seems <laughs> to me technological solutions like this are doomed to failure because whatever we come up with, if it's that, the bacteria are too smart or they rep reproduce too fast for us to be permanent in our solutions and they're going to get around it someday. Please. You know, and I, and I know exactly what you mean by that, and there is a lot of truth in it. The problem is that if you don't stay one step ahead of them, mm -hmm. the consequences are rather grim, you know. So um, developing the latest um, group of antibiotics, I think, is very important. Um, so that would certainly be one thing that we can do. Um, 
we're trying to um, avoid situations where people are in abject poverty and are living, you know, say in homeless shelters mm -hmm. and um, that type of thing is also important because um, if you look at places where resistant strains of tuberculosis have developed and gained a foothold, they tend to be impoverished areas, mm -hmm. places like homeless shelters, sometimes in prisons, um, poor neighborhoods, and, and, and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can do to see public health as a good that we need to give to everyone mm -hmm. and not, you know, uh, germs don't respect social class mm -hmm. and germs don't respect borders. So mm -hmm. um, if you're talking about public health, then you need to take care of the poorest in the community in order to be able to keep everyone safe. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's certainly something that we could do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in terms of individual things that people can do, just things like, um, I know people who are really experts in this field and have spent their whole lives in it. When they go into hotels, um, oftentimes well, the very first thing they will do will be wipe down the telephone with uh, some kind of uh, you know, antiseptic, wipe mm -hmm. down the doorknobs and things like that. So that's something that you, know, you may feel a little embarrassed doing it if people are watching I you. I wipe down the exercise machine in <laughs> my condo. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so those little things, just wiping down surfaces that people may have touched, is an important thing that everyone could do using hand sanitizer. And in fact, in a lot of these outbreaks, one of the really interesting things is there are people that are called super spreaders. And we don't really understand why they are super spreaders, but there were super spreaders in the Ebola outbreak, there were super spreaders in the SARS outbreak. And um, those people, especially in one case with the SARS outbreak, when uh, there was a gentleman in a hotel and he touched a lot of surfaces and things like that, people picked that up. So just taking simple precautions when you're in a public place and you know sanitizing things can be important. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, what was that? The super... Uh, super spreader. Spreader, super, super spreader. spreader, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's a person who... He is more contagious or something than others? Yes, and, and we don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, so in some cases, it could be people who um, have a compromised immune system, but that doesn't seem to be true in a lot of the, in a lot of the cases. So we don't know why. Um, but the, the fact is that there are people that seem to infect the majority of people in a particular area, and you, you could trace back the cases to that one person, which is, you know, statistically, you would expect that uh, each person would infect at the same rate, but that's not necessarily mm. true. So we don't. So we have to identify the super spreaders so we can isolate them. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, I'm so glad you brought that up because isolation and quarantine, I think, are going to be coming back. Uh, into public consciousness. And I wish I didn't have to say that because I think um, people tend to look at that as something that is relegated to history. You mm -hmm. know, that's something they did back in the olden mm -hmm. days. Um, but the olden days, in a way, uh, when you talk about public health, are coming back mm -hmm. because um, if we don't have viable antibiotics, then we can't even prevent outbreaks of things like the plague, um, you know, other bacterial diseases. So I, I hope these super spreaders aren't concentrated in certain races because this is <laughs> no. going to be very, no. very bad oh, and I, volatile. I, you know, it, that would. It actually, um, What's the, yeah, the whole so far? idea of race is is constructed anyway. There's no real yeah. such thing as a race anyway. You except know, in and, our minds. Except <laughs> in our minds. So the idea that there would be any biological basis for that is just, uh, yeah. you know, would never be true. Yeah. Um, okay. but, Let's hope. Um, if, um, but, but there can be um, scenarios where people come from an impoverished part of the world and because of the poverty they've mm -hmm. been living in, they're more likely to be exposed to mm -hmm. infectious disease. They wouldn't be super spreaders necessarily as a person. They, they just came from an area that's contaminated with right, whatever right, it right. was. A super spreader, we don't understand mm -hmm. why some people mm -hmm. are super spreaders. And as far as we know, that has nothing to do with social class mm -hmm. or anything else. You know, it may just have to do with the viral load mm -hmm. in the case of a viral illness. So but May um, I point out one other thing that's really counterintuitive, and that is the the flu that wiped out people in 1918, the cruelest part of it was it took young people. That's right. And the old people that we think, well, they're going to die anyhow, they're 67 <laughs> years old. Like, like pneumonia, it was, used to be called the, uh, the, uh, 
the, the grateful disease or something, or they, uh, something. It was a good thing because it took them quickly, and they're getting close to death anyhow. Mm -hmm. uh, but this flu took the young, the strong people, right. and not the old people. Yes, that's really color too. That's that's sort of frightening. Yes, absolutely. And that particular strain of influenza, um, it um, it created a. Um, a tendency for the body to attack itself, um, which is why people with the strongest immune systems, um, i.e. the young, tended to get the worst cases of influenza. And it did, unfortunately, strike young adults, mm -hmm. um, you know, just ravaged mm -hmm. the young adult population. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the things that I mean about the fact that we just do not understand fully certain things about um, viruses and about bacteria. We don't necessarily always know what it is that causes, uh, you know, it, it, the influenza virus mutates extremely rapidly. And that's why there are so many different strains, part of the reason why there's so many different strains circulating right now. Um, mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily understand when a mutation occurs, mm -hmm. what actual impact will that have mm -hmm. on human beings or on animal populations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, so obviously it is a concern in, in poultry and swine mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah. How about poultry and swine and things like that? Is there something we can do there? I mean, we, I, we can't, I guess we can kill our animals or something like Which this. Which is but what we've been doing. Yeah. You know, we, uh, it, the, the way that it's handled now is usually through culling. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a nice way of saying we, we kill all the animals. Um, and um, so um, is that the best way? Well, you know, it's really difficult to say. If we kill the animals, would the plant life leave us alone or are they going to get us too? <laughs> the plant life. You know, it's very, very rare for a plant virus um, to be able to infect an animal. That's very rare. But it is very common for an animal virus to be able to infect a human. And there are cases of reverse zoonosis where uh, a human virus can actually infect an animal. Mm -hmm. So um, humans and animals, as you probably know, have been exchanging microorganisms, you know, mm -hmm. since long before written mm -hmm. history. And most of our European crowd diseases mm -hmm. um, actually come from uh, zoonotic diseases mm -hmm. that were passed into the mm -hmm. populations from animals. Yeah, so. in fact, uh, those populations, they died off early, like say in Europe. But when those uh, Europeans went to, let's say, America, they were already had the immunity by that time, which, exactly. the, which the others who had never been exposed to cattle or whatever exactly suddenly right. got it and they killed them off. Yes. Well. From what I gather here, what we ought to do, we have to become vegetarians, number one. <laughs> <laughs> Kill off the animals. <laughs> and watch those pants very carefully. Well, this has been very illuminating. I'm, you really added a whole dimension to Dr. King's and my uh, analysis of the upcoming disaster and civilizations that we have to watch out for. And uh, the other thing is you really leave us, we have to just keep running, staying ahead of what those viruses are. <laughs>